What's up, guys? Welcome back. Welcome back. Cool. Hey, uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, so today I want to do something a little bit different. I've been kind of like re- revising um, how I want to do this podcast. Um, essentially, I'm under the assumption that, every, that all of my processes are wrong. And I'm just trying to make them less wrong. <laughs> so we're going to have a little bit of an adventure today. Um, and today, um, we're going to go over a section called principles of growth and change. So we've gone over paradigms. We've gone over um, like the character ethic, the personality ethic, how to shift a paradigm, uh, and what a principle-centered paradigm looks like and what some principles are, um, like integrity, honesty, human dignity, service, quality, excellence, potential. Um, and today, we're going to go over the principles of growth and of change. Now, for the framework of this podcast, I want to experiment with it a little bit and shift it to more of a, um, to answer the question, like as I'm reading this, yes, teach it to better understand the ideas and concepts. But also in addition to that, um, answering the question, why does this even matter? Like why should someone pick up this book and read it and apply the things that that are in it, or apply the principles and teachings that are in it, or that it um, embodies. Why does it matter? Why is it even important? Why why should someone care, right? And so that's that's the question that I want to answer and to formulate my ideas off of and to base them off of that question. Okay, so diving in, um, principles of growth and change it says here. Um, The glitter of the personality ethic, the massive appeal, is that there is some quick and easy way to achieve quality of life. Personal effectiveness and rich, deep relationships with other people without going through the natural process of work and growth that makes it possible. Um, I actually love his use of the word glitter because it does give it this massive appeal to it, like makes it look like it's going to work. And it very well may work short term but long term any sort of like meaningful goal or 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 like true inner joy like true rich deep meaningful relationships um has to be based off principles of growth and change there is no quick scheme um or quick get rich uh fast scheme um to build those meaningful relationships now what's scary about that comment though is that a lot of us don't even understand the depth that relationships can actually get to because we've never gone that far with anybody. Not with ourselves, not with God, not with Christ, not with the, even our parents, spouse, or kids. Um, and frankly, being honest, I'm not really one to talk. <laughs> I'm still working on it, but I'm aware of, I'm aware of this fact that the relationships go way deeper than I than than, than I am even, than I am even aware of. They go way, way way deeper, and there's so much work to do to be able to build that. And I just haven't paid that price yet. I haven't gone that far into it, and so I'm like really excited to be able to do that. Um, so I think why that's important is it creates like new boundaries. It like pushes the limits of of of, of humanity. Right, and um, it opens your eyes to a new world, where instead of living out of your memory of past relationships, you're actually living out out of your imagination, thinking if this if this relationship could be the most ideal, like quality of relationship, the most ideal like richness or deepness or depth, then like what what would that be? What does that look like? What does that feel like? And the answer to that question will most likely be a different answer than probably like your most deep relationship that you currently have right now. So, yeah, that brings a lot of joy into our lives. Um, going on, Stephen Covey says, It's symbol without substance. It's the get-rich-quick scheme promising wealth without work. And it might even appear to su- succeed, but the schemer re- remains. Personality ethic is illusory and deceptive, and trying to get high-quality results with its techniques and quick fixes is just about as effective as trying to get to some place in Chicago using a map of Detroit. Um, 
so why that's important is we get so caught up in the attraction and the appeal of the personality. I think up this like quick fix or shortcuts. Um, and up front, it looks like it's going to work very, very well and efficient. But long term, it doesn't work. And so it's important to understand that. And to when you begin a process or begin a goal or begin any activity or any purpose or any event, it's important to take a step back and to think, am I doing a quick fix, a shortcut, or am I really diving deep into the roots of the problem? Am I really living with a principle-centered paradigm? Because if you don't have the principle-centered paradigm, you're going to get caught up in this shortcut, um, in this shortcut idea of, of get the wealth without the work. And life doesn't work like that. The planet wasn't built like that. Like you have to water the tree. You have to nourish it and give it sunlight and oxygen and prune it and prune it and dig it and take care of it and give it fertilizer and like let it grow. Um, and so like that's important because when you begin an activity, you need to take a step back and really become self-aware of which uh, which roadmap you're taking the personality ethic or the character ethic a principle centered paradigm or a different sandy foundation paradigm going on Stephen Covey says in the words of Eric Fromm an astute observer of the roots and fruits of the personality ethic today we come across an individual who behaves like an automaton who does not know or understand himself and the only person that he knows is the person that he is supposed to be whose meaningless chatter has replaced communicative speech, whose synthetic smile has replaced genuine laughter, and whose sense of dull despair has taken the place of genuine pain. Two statements may be said concerning this individual. One is that he suffers from defects of spontaneity and individuality, which may seem to be incurable. And at the same time, it may, it may be said of him, he does not differ essentially from the millions of the rest of us who walk upon this earth. It's a fascinating quote that one, he suffers from the defects of spontaneity and individuality. And two, he does not differ from millions of us who roam this earth. Um, yeah, it's like that's that's important because like someone should care about this because Essentially, you're just going through, through the motions without actually getting any, like, reward for your efforts. Like, you're not actually, like, finding joy in the work. Like, for example, like, in door-to-door sales, I might, like, I might be able to, like, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think of an example, but, um, like, I might try and recruit a team and, like, um, put on, like, a smile and, like, try to get on their good side, you know, using techniques and buy them incentives or buy them dinner or something like that. But like deep down, if like, I don't have that true character, of like being just being a good friend and like truly, truly like loving them and caring for them, then ultimately I'm going to burn out. I'm going to run out of, of motivation and fuel. And it may seem like that'll work in the short term, but long run, it's like a game over. GG, it's not going to work. That's really cool. Um, he goes on, in all of life, there are sequential stages of growth and development. A child learns to turn over, to sit up, to crawl, and then to walk and run. Each step is important and each one takes time. No step can be skipped. So there are checkpoints that we have to go through. And that's important because you can't skip checkpoints. You have to go through the process. When you're learning something new, you have to go through that punch the nose phase where it sucks. <laughs> Like snowboarding, for example. I love snowboarding right now. It is one of the most thrilling, pleasurable experiences of my life. Like, I love just flying down the mountain. But boy, did I go through hell and back to learn how to snowboard. <laughs> so many butt aches and knee injuries and, like, headaches and almost concussions from falling down and bumping my head. So it takes time. You have to go through these 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 checkpoints of growth of of change. Uh, he says here, this is true in all phases of life, in all areas of development. 
whether it be learning to play the piano or communicate effectively with a working associate or even like your kids or spouse or, um, or marriage or whatever. It is true with individuals, with marriages, well, he says it here, with families and with organizations. We know and accept this fact or principle of process in the area of physical things, but to understand it in emotional areas, in human relations, and even in the area of personal character is less common and more difficult. Wow. That's super cool. Uh, I look at like Christ's teachings and how he uses like um, the bread and water to like symbolize his body and his blood and what that means for us, right? And it's like we like very much understand bread and water, like how it feeds us, it gives us energy, it hydrates us, we need it to survive day in and day out or we die. Um, and that's like a symbolism of like, of like what Christ does as well. Like he uses that because it's so common, because it's so like unique, um, but like also general at the same time where everyone understands it. And so it's like a symbol to teach this deeper emotional and spiritual meaning that sometimes we don't really understand. And so it's meant to teach us about our relationship with Christ and how our spirits are can like make covenants with each other and um, and connect in those ways. And so that's like really cool. Um, and so it's also just becoming self-aware and understanding that like these relationships take time that when you first meet someone, they're, they're not going to trust you. And like, you should like expect that. <laughs> like, you kind of have to like earn their trust as time goes on and be the a person that is trustworthy in order to have that trust. That's why the private victory comes before the public the victory. Um, he, he goes on saying, and even if we understand it, to accept it and to live in harmony with it are even less common and more difficult. So living it is even harder than it is just becoming aware of it. That's fascinating. Um, consequently, we sometimes look for a shortcut, expecting to be able to skip some of these vital steps in order to save time and effort and still reap the desired re result. Uh, something that my, my boss tells me a lot, um, Tim Hedrick, he says that... Um, fetch, I forgot it. Um, oh, I'll have to remember it. Um, oh, wait. And even if we understand it, to accept it and to live it in harmony with it are even less common and more difficult. Consequently, we're just going to look for a shortcut, expecting to be able to skip some of these vital steps in order to save time and effort and still reap the desired result. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I forgot what. Probably an amazing quote, but uh, <laughs> I spaced it. If I remember it, I'll... I'll say it. Um, so yeah, like that's important because we have to actually live it. We can't ju just become aware of it, but we have to like take a step back and be aware that like it's like um, to expect things to happen. That's what it was. Tim says that we need to, if something like bad happens or what we view as bad, then we should adopt the belief. Yeah, I expected that to happen. Um, which is true. That's like the principles of change and growth. When you learn a new skill and like you're not progressing as much as you would like, it's like, yeah, I expect this to happen. That's how principles operate. It's how it works. It takes time and it takes pain to get to that joy and light at the end of the, the, the tunnel. Going on, he says, but what happens when we attempt to shortcut a natural process in our growth and development? If you are only an average tennis player but decide to play at a higher level in order to make a better impression what 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 will result would positive thinking alone enable you to com to compete effectively against a professional okay guys this is really cool actually um i believe everything is a choice however these choices are a process not an event let me repeat that everything is a choice but the choices are a process not an event. For example, Stephen Covey talks a lot about how by taking precautions and eating healthy and exercising and getting enough sleep and rest, we can prevent so many of the, of the diseases that attack our society and our culture nowadays. Um, it's unreal how, how 
how that is, but it's true. If we eat healthy, if we rest up, if we exercise properly with strength, cardio, flexibility, um, if we eat all the, the the nutrients that we need, then we can actually protect ourselves against a lot of the diseases that do attack us. And so like that's that's like a choice, right? And so when you choose to pick up one end of the stick, you choose to pick up the other end of the stick. And so like that's what he's saying here, that like um that like if you are only an average tennis player but decide to play at a higher level in order to make a better impression, what will result? Would positive thinking alone enable you to, com- to compete effectively against a professional? No, it wouldn't. Positive thinking isn't going to help you there. You've already made the choice to be an average tennis player. Like that's where you're at. Your choices before that have led you to have led you to just becoming an average tennis player. And so somewhere in there, like there wasn't the the the, the choices were not made to make you a professional tennis player. And so therefore you have chosen to become a tennis player, right? Um, hope that makes sense. Um, going on, it says, what if you were to lead your friends to believe you could play the piano at concert hall level while your actual present skill was that of a beginner? So you could lie and tell people that you could do these amazing things, but then when it comes down to it, can you? What do your actions say? The answer is obvious. It is simply impossible to violate, ignore, or shortcut this development process. It is contrary to nature, and attempting to seek such a shortcut only results in disappointment and frustration. Yeah, that's actually so true. That happens to me with um, with school, with doing homework, and like just wanting to get the the assignment done instead of ask instead of actually learning from the assignment. I develop so much frustration from doing schoolwork because I just want to get it done. I want to finish it. I want that quick fix, that quick A. I don't actually want to internalize the information that I'm getting, um, which makes it so frustrating when I don't go at the pace that I want to do, which usually doesn't happen (laughs) because I'm doing this quick fix. I'm not actually learning the material. And then when it comes to the tests or the quizzes, uh, like I'm screwed. I get AF'd over. And so the ability to um, take a step back, become aware of this character ethic, become aware of principles of growth and change, and to really seek knowledge and to really change who I am through this knowledge of learning. Like, yeah, it might take it might, it might take longer in the short run, but long term, it's going to be way more effective and beneficial to me. I can actually help other people that way with that knowledge instead of just learning at the other grade and then not actually being able to help others um on a 10 point scale if i am at level two in any field and desire to move to a a level five i must first take the step toward level three a thousand mile journey begins with the first step and can only be taken one step at a, a, a time um yeah so like you have to go through the steps. There's a straight and narrow path that leads to your goal towards your purpose. And you can't skip steps. There are checkpoints you have to go through. Um, and so like expecting, like that's important because expecting that will drastically decrease frustration, stress, and anxiety. Expecting the, the, the pain, the growth, the process of change, um, becoming aware that is going to happen is drastically going to help you achieve all of your goals and to realize that you can take the next step and that's like the next um, thing that you should do instead of focusing super far out in the future just take the next step um says here if you don't let a teacher know at what level you are by asking a question or revealing your ignorance you will not learn or grow you cannot pretend for long for you will eventually be found out Admission of ignorance is often the first step in our education. Uh, Thoreau taught, how can we remember our, our ignorance, which, which our growth, sorry, let me back up. How can we remember our ignorance, which our growth requires when we are using our knowledge all the time? Well, it's actually super interesting how like we want to come across as these people who, who like has knowledge, who like, who who want to be able to like express things. 
but what's cool about that is saying that like no our our ignorance is what is what um our ignorance is what produces growth and so admitting to yourself that you don't know is actually what's going to produce you to to grow and to change and so when we when we use our knowledge all the time we never grow that's actually really fascinating that's cool um I am I choose to underline that real quick because I want to write that down into my first creation of the summer. Um and I also want to underline this right here. Thanks for your patience, guys. I appreciate it. Um Okay, so going on, he says, um, I recall one occasion when two young women, daughters of a friend of mine, came to me tearfully, complaining about their father's harshness and lack of understanding. They were afraid to open up with their parents for fear of the consequences, and yet they desperately needed their parents' love, understanding, and guidance. I talked with the father and found that he was intellectually aware of what was happening, but while he admitted he had a temper problem, he refused to take responsibility for it and to honestly accept the fact that his emotional development level was super low. It was more than his pride could swallow to take the first step toward change. That's interesting. So intellectually, his mind, he knows, but in his heart, he's very, very weak. So guys, that's actually really, really important. And you should like actually care about this because you are a human being. What that means is you have a spirit, a heart, a body, and a mind. Now, it is part of our purpose on this earth to conquer those four, to submit them to, to, to our will to our will and then hopefully submit our will to a higher will preferably god's will right and so what's cool about that is like um this idea he's talking about this emotional development was low so like his mind intellectually he knew that it was a thing but because we're four-dimensional beings spirit mind body and heart the development of his heart wasn't actually that high and so he couldn't actually progress to a level where he could help his daughters out. So like, guys, hear me out, okay? Thinking about my family in the future is one of the things that motivates me the most. I do a lot of right brain activities with my family, envisioning my wife and my kids um, and the kind of relationships that I have with them, the things we're doing, like what that feels like, the joy, the passion, like the gratitude, the the kindness, the love in the home. I've thought a lot about my my dream home and like what pictures I would have on the walls and all the stuff. And so like, at least I don't know about you guys, but at least for me, my 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 family and of course as of right now my future family. It's a very powerful motivating factor for me. And so what the story is saying is that a parent didn't have the capacity, didn't have the intelligence to build a deep, meaningful relationship. Now, I could be assuming here, but I imagine he didn't have that because he's, he's been based in the personality ethic his whole life, looking for these quick fixes, where his daughters do what he wants them to do. They clean their room, they don't get in trouble, they eat their vegetables, right? They, they do all the things that the parents want them to do but there's no underlying motivation no underlying relationship no underlying joy or meaning or passion or compassion in life um and so because of that his daughters are suffering a lot because of their father's harshness and guys this is interesting here because you may not think that this is the the, the this is you you may not think that you are the kind of person that would do that. But I promise you are, and I am too. We all are, are the, we, we all are this father right here. We all have, have further developments to go in our hearts and our spirits. It says here, he refused to take responsibility for it. It was more than his pride could swallow to take the first step toward change. I am breaking myself against principles. Like I said, all my processes are wrong. I admit that. I'm aware of that. I believe that. I'm trying to make them less wrong over time. I'm ignorant. I don't know the best way to, to treat kids. I've never done it before. 
with, at least with my own kids. I have an idea, like a theory, but like, I don't actually know. And that propels me to grow, to ask questions and to become better, a better father and husband, a, you know, a better parent. And so it take responsibility, be proactive. It just do it. Okay. This is us. We are this father. Sorry. I am very passionate about that, but it's so true guys. Just, it's awesome. I love it. Anyways, going on, um, to relate effectively with a wife, a husband, children, friends, or working associates, we must learn to listen. And this requires emotional strength. Listening involves patience, openness, and the desire to understand. Highly developed qualities of character. It's so much easier to, to operate from a low emotional level and to give high level advice. Yeah, that's true. Um... Listening is super powerful, super impactful. Um, it's so much easier to, to operate from a low emotional level and to give high level advice. Um, I'm actually convinced that our ability to listen is a very accurate measurement of our character. The stronger our character is, the the more um, the more intact and Kind of like grounded we are in our values and what we believe in and in who we are. The more we believe in who we are, the more confidence we have, the more inner security we have, the more like guidance, wisdom, and power we have. And so when we are when we truly listen to someone because we love them, we open up ourselves to become influenced. And in doing so, we risk being influenced. We are becoming vulnerable to another to another frame of reference. When we leave our own frame of reference, enter someone's enter someone else's frame of reference as we listen to them, that can be dangerous. And people without a, a a changeless core inside of them, people without that inner security won't do that. They actually can't do that. They don't have the inner integrity yet to be able to open up like that. They just won't. Like it it won't happen, I promise. Which is why so many people don't listen. Um, and that's like so true for me too. Like, um, I'm like not trying to like exclude, um, myself. That's like all why I'm doing the study is to like become aware of these ideas. And as I'm doing this, I say this, but like I am actually filled with like my own weaknesses and how I don't take the time to listen to people and how that's like just my own personal insecurities surfacing and how, um, yeah, like it's just, yeah, I just like, <laughs> I'm getting better, but um, it's so, so true. Um, it says here, our level of development is fairly obvious with tennis or piano playing where it is impossible to pretend, but it is not so obvious in the areas of character and emotional de development. That's, that's interesting how it's not so obvious. You can clearly tell if someone is good at playing tennis or good at playing the piano. But it's not so obvious who's good at building relationships. That takes time on whose character is good. We can pose and put on for a stranger or an associate. We can pretend. And for a while, we can get by with it, at least in public. We might even deceive ourselves. Yeah, I believe that most of us know the truth of what we really are inside. And I think many of those we live with and work with do as well. I have seen the consequences of attempting to shortcut this natural process of growth, often in, in the business world, where executives attempt to buy a new culture of improved pro productivity, quality, morale, and customer service with strong speeches, smile training, and external interventions, or through mergers, acquisitions, and friendly or unfriendly takeovers. But they ignore the low trust climate produced by such manipulations. When these methods don't work, they look for other personality ethic techniques that will, all the time ignoring and violating the natural principles and processes on which a high trust culture is based. Essentially, they're wanting to get this high trust culture, this high productivity, 
this um, high quality, morale, excitement, passion without paying the price, without developing that inner sense of character. They, 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 they'll smile more, they'll give strong speeches or effective trainings or buy everyone lunch or buy everyone donuts, but those things don't last. They're not meaningful. People don't actually care about those. They'll, they'll like it for five or 10 minutes and it may seem like it works then in those five to 10 minutes, but after that, you're back to square one. It's just not effective. So take a step back and look at what are the principles that a high trust culture is built off of? What does that entail? How does one do that? And then go and do the work. Fix yourself first. So then you can create that high trust um, culture. That, that just exhumes from your being, from your essence. Um, guys, there's, there's a little break here um, in 7 Habits. And we're getting about a half hour long. So I'm going to stop here for, for tonight. Um, but wow, that was really powerful. I'm, I actually learned a lot um, about... Um, doing the per, the character ethic, um, using our ignorance instead of our knowledge, and then a thousand mile journey begins with, with the first step, and can only be taken one step at a time. That it's a process, not an event. Um, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this. Really appreciate it, and um, like and subscribe. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.